They were once called the only way to save Florida's coastline, pumping millions of tons of sand, building seawalls, redrawing the shoreline through projects labeled beach nourishment and coastal protection. Billions of dollars in taxpayer and insurance money poured in to protect homes, resorts, and the feeling of coastal safety. Then something unusual began to appear. The new sand vanished faster than expected. Waves shifted direction. Areas once considered safe started showing up on risk maps. Even without a major storm passing through, public beach access narrowed, while the shoreline continued to be redrawn, not because Florida failed to intervene, but because the more authorities tried to hold the coast in place, the more it reacted in ways that were harder to control. And the most unsettling part is that all of this unfolded quietly, long after the decisions had already been signed. So who decided how this coastline would be saved, and why does it seem that the more it is rescued, the worse it becomes? Florida's coast is changing faster than expected. Florida's coastline is still there, but the ability to reach it is quietly slipping away. In many Gulf Coast towns, familiar access points have become harder to use, without warnings or headlines, just enough for residents to realize that the beach is slowly moving out of reach. Florida says it is saving the coast. Yet with every repair, the boundaries become clearer. If this truly is protection, the question is no longer how the sea is changing but who is allowed to remain close to it and who is being pushed back in near silence. Florida grew alongside the ocean, not only through tourism, but through survival. The shoreline here is not a postcard backdrop. It is a shield against storms, a system that holds sand and water and allows coastal towns to endure one season after another. For decades, people believed that as long as the shoreline held, everything else would follow. Some changes, though, do not arrive with crashing waves. They arrive through interrupted routines, for many people, the beach is not a weekend destination. It is a daily rhythm, a morning walk, a familiar place to sit and watch the water, a pattern repeated long enough to feel like safety. When access points shift or narrow, what disappears is not just distance, but the rhythm of an ordinary day. One retired couple living a few blocks from the water says they still see the ocean every morning, but they are no longer sure they can step onto the sand the way they once did. We did not lose the beach, the husband said. We lost the way to it, for them, this is not about zoning or legal rights. It is about having to think before doing something that once felt natural, and once a habit requires consideration, it is no longer a habit. In Pinellas County, where erosion risk ranks among the highest, the sight of heavy equipment and temporary fencing has become as familiar as the season itself. Each restoration brings promises of a wider, stronger, safer beach, and for a short time, the sand does return and the shoreline looks renewed. At the same time, it becomes more expensive, more tightly managed, and further removed from those who do not live directly on the water. No one calls this displacement. On paper, everything is framed in positive terms. Restoration, protection, long-term stability. But on the ground, communities begin to separate in quieter ways. Those closest to the shore focus on defending homes from storms. Those further inland focus on preserving access, just to feel connected to the place they call home. Both concerns are valid and both groups sense they are slowly losing something. What makes this story worth deeper thought is not that the coastline is changing. Florida has always changed. What stands out is that as every possible resource is used to hold the shoreline in place, the bond between people and the coast grows more fragile. As if, in preserving the shape of the beach, no one stopped to ask who would still be able to stand on it. And from that moment, a larger question begins to form. When Florida says it is saving the coastline, what exactly is being saved? and who will be left to carry what falls behind. Two, when fixing the coast created new risks. In Florida, many people have not lost their homes and have not lost the ocean, but they are losing access to the shoreline where they have lived their entire lives. Not because of storms, but because coastal protection projects have narrowed or erased public access points. The beach may look safer and more attractive, yet residents are forced to stand farther back to see it. If these projects are meant to protect the community, then the question becomes which community is being protected and who is being quietly left out. If this were viewed town by town, it might appear to be a series of uneven local management decisions. But when the entire Florida coastline is considered, the pattern becomes clearer. This is not a collection of isolated incidents. It is an ongoing condition sustained by a larger system. Florida has one of the longest and most fragile coastlines in the United States. Thousands of miles of sand are constantly shaped by waves, tides, coastal currents, and tropical storms. 
because of this. Decades ago, the state created a formal mechanism to track shoreline conditions, identifying where beaches are stable, where erosion is occurring, and where intervention is required in documents from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. One term appears again and again, critically eroded shoreline. The list is updated regularly, and in technical terms, it is neither good nor bad. It simply triggers a process. That trigger, however, creates a paradox. Once a beach is classified as critically eroded, it is almost never considered fully stabilized. Sand can be added. The shoreline can widen for a time. But the system is not designed to reach an endpoint. If an area were declared permanently stable, it would no longer qualify for future maintenance funding. The result is that many coastal communities enter a cycle of repeated repair. Year after year, beaches are restored, then eroded, then restored again. From a management perspective, this is routine maintenance, similar to reinforcing levees or patching bridges. From the resident's perspective, it feels very different. Each repair cycle brings side effects. Heavy equipment arrives. Temporary fencing goes up. Access signs are rerouted. At first, these changes are described as temporary. A few weeks, then a few months, over time, they become so routine that people are no longer sure how open the beach once was. One coastal engineer put it plainly, Florida's beaches are not repaired to return them to their original state, but to delay the next repair. Technically, this statement is accurate. Sand is mobile. Over the long term, waves always win. But when this logic enters daily community life, delay is no longer a neutral concept. For coastal residents, every delay comes with a cost. Financial, as public budgets and local taxes absorb repeated expenses. Time, as access points are altered for months at a stretch. And emotional, as people grow accustomed to asking permission, waiting, or taking detours to do things that once felt natural. What stands out is that in planning documents, words like restoration, protection, and long-term stability are central. Public access rarely is, not because it lacks importance, but because it is difficult to measure, difficult to standardize, and difficult to fit into engineering diagrams. This is where a gap begins to form. On one side is a system designed to manage sand, waves, and budgets. On the other is the daily life of communities that live with the shoreline every day. When the two sides do not speak the same language, separation becomes normalized. If the beach is always in need of repair, the question is no longer whether to fix it. The question is who decides when the community gets to stand in front of the ocean, and when standing behind a fence becomes acceptable. 3. Who really decides Florida's changing shoreline? In Florida, the shoreline does not change because of waves alone. It changes because of money. Beach rescue projects appear where budgets and contracts are ready, making the coast look safer and more polished, but also more tightly controlled. When funding begins to shape the shoreline, residents are rarely asked for input. From that moment on, the beach stops being only a natural space and becomes the result of decisions signed in advance. In practice, most coastal protection projects in Florida do not begin with community debate or environmental science, but with funding. Where money exists, projects move forward. Where it does not, plans stall. For many coastal counties, the primary source is hotel and resort occupancy taxes, often referred to as tourism development taxes. The argument is familiar. Tourists come for the beach. The beach must be protected to keep tourists coming. And tourist dollars then cycle back to maintain the beach itself. On paper, this appears logical, even fair. Yet this very mechanism quietly sets priorities. When funding is closely tied to tourism, projects are designed first to serve appearance, stability, and a sense of safety for visitors. Beaches must look clean. They must be easy to manage. Risk must be minimized in areas with high property value, harder to measure factors, such as the routines of local residents or long-used access points woven into daily life, rarely become central to financial planning. In places like Pinellas County, Large-scale sand pumping projects have become a familiar sight. To outsiders, they signal that authorities are actively protecting the shoreline. To longtime residents, each new investment often brings more temporary fencing, more rerouted signs, and changes described as short-term that stretch from one season into the next. Once budgets are approved and contracts signed, major decisions are effectively locked in. The primary objective becomes finishing on schedule and meeting financial commitments. Adjustments tied to community life are often treated as secondary because they do not directly affect cash flow or legal obligations. For the system, this is efficiency. For residents, it feels like being placed at the bottom of the priority list. There is something rarely stated outright. Once a project enters implementation, stopping to consult residents is no longer seen as realistic. 
Any delay means higher costs, legal exposure, and political pressure. So even when inconveniences become obvious in daily life, the system tends to push forward rather than step back. This operating model causes projects to repeat in the same familiar areas. Beaches that have received funding are more likely to receive it again because precedent and mechanisms already exist. Areas less tied to tourism often wait longer, even when their need for protection is just as real. Over time, an invisible map forms along Florida's shoreline. Not a map of nature, but of cash flow. Some stretches are carefully maintained, others are deferred, and with that map, residents' experiences begin to diverge based on where they live. No decision in this process is made with the explicit goal of excluding anyone, but when money, contracts, and timelines intersect, the outcome becomes clear. Some access points remain, some are narrowed, some become temporary for years at a time. To residents, the shoreline changes feel inevitable. What few are told is that long before waves or storms reshape the coast, quiet decisions have already been signed. And from that moment on, the distance between people and the shoreline has largely been decided in advance. 4. How ordinary lives are quietly pushed inland. Large changes are often explained through maps, budgets, and long-term plans, but for people who live along Florida's coast, those changes show up differently, quietly and up close. They work their way into daily routines, into things that were once taken for granted. For many older residents, the beach is not a tourist destination. It is a schedule, a morning walk, a familiar place to sit and watch the waves. When public access points are rerouted or narrowed, what is lost is not just a few extra minutes of walking, but a rhythm of life that has been maintained for many years. Some people say they can still see the ocean from their homes, yet it feels as if the sea has moved farther away, not because the water has receded, but because the path down to the sand is now longer, more indirect, or blocked by temporary fencing that no one can say for certain when it will be removed. Those small changes are enough to make many people hesitate before going out, and when a habit requires hesitation, it stops being a habit. For those who make a living near the water, the impact takes a different shape. Coastal service businesses are used to seasonal change. But when projects stretch on, uncertainty becomes the new normal. Today they can operate. Next week, they may face restrictions. No one offers a clear timeline. That uncertainty does not appear in press releases, but it shows up in daily life. Small plans get postponed. Income becomes less predictable. And there is a growing sense that everything depends on decisions made far from the stretch of sand where they stand. What troubles many people is not that the shoreline is being repaired. They understand that erosion is real. Storms are real. What is harder to accept is that these changes unfold as if community life were a secondary concern. Meetings are held. Blueprints are published. Yet very few residents feel they truly have a say in shaping the spaces they use every day. Over time, the change no longer affects only walkways or fences. It reaches into the sense of belonging. Some beaches begin to feel less like places for everyday life and more like spaces managed for order and appearance. People start adjusting on their own. They go earlier, they travel farther, or they stay home. These changes rarely arrive alongside a single disaster. They happen slowly, season by season, project by project. There is no clear moment to react, only a point at which people realize that what once felt close has become distant. And in that quiet shift, the shoreline stops being just a story about sand and waves. It becomes a story about who has to adjust their life and who is expected to accept that things are different now, even though no one ever said it out loud. 5. When public beaches stop feeling truly public. For a long time, the beach was something people assumed would always be there. Open to everyone, without permission, without conditions, whether someone lived near or far, the shoreline felt like shared space where social boundaries seemed to fade. As coastal protection projects multiply, that understanding has begun to change, not through a single major decision, but through a series of small adjustments. Access points become more controlled. Visiting hours are quietly reorganized. Open space slowly takes on the character of a tightly managed area, where everything has a valid reason to exist, yet very little feels spontaneous. Over time, the beach becomes not just a place to go, but a place to comply with. New rules are rarely described as restrictions, they are framed as safety, order, property protection. Each reason on its own is difficult to argue against. The problem is that when all those reasons add up, the shared experience changes. Those with more flexibility adapt more easily. They can travel farther, choose different times, or find alternatives. For many older residents, coastal workers, and long-established communities, 
The beach was never one option among many. It was the only one. This shift does not produce open conflict. It creates quiet separation. No one is formally pushed off the beach. Yet not everyone continues to feel that the beach belongs to them. As shared space increasingly follows the logic of risk management and property value, a sense of belonging becomes tied to one's ability to adapt. Some mornings, the beach is still open, but familiar faces that once appeared regularly are no longer there, not because they do not want to come, but because they no longer feel at ease. The sand they knew gradually becomes a place, designed more for visitors than for the community around it. From a management perspective, these changes are often seen as success. The shoreline is more stable. Damage is reduced. Tourism is protected. From a social perspective, the story is more complicated. When the beach is treated as an asset to be optimized, the idea of a shared commons begins to fade. Without full privatization, a place can still become unfamiliar to the people most connected to it. And when that happens, what is lost is not just convenience, but the sense that some places exist to belong to everyone. The concern is not that the beach is being managed more carefully. It is that people are slowly becoming accustomed to shared spaces coming with conditions. When freedom is replaced by procedure, the sense of loss does not arrive all at once. It builds gradually, and by the time people realize the beach is no longer understood the way it once was, the change has already become normal. 6. Who changed more, nature or the people? Florida still has the ocean. The tides still rise and fall. Sand is still added year after year. From a distance, everything appears unchanged. But for those who have lived here long enough, it becomes clear that the real change is not at the horizon, but in how people step out to meet it. For decades, society's instinctive response to risk has been repair. Erosion is reinforced. Flooding is elevated. Instability is managed more tightly. These responses come from good intentions from a desire to protect people from a coastline that is increasingly unpredictable. But the more repairs are made, the more complex the system becomes. And as systems grow more complex, the distance between decisions and daily life begins to widen. In Florida, few people feel they have lost the ocean. It is still there. Yet many feel their relationship with it has changed. It no longer feels as natural, no longer as simple. Every interaction now carries procedures, schedules, and justifications that are reasonable enough to be difficult to oppose. This leads to an uncomfortable question. When we say we are protecting the shoreline, what are we protecting first? Land, structures, economic value, or the relationship between people and the places they have lived alongside for generations. There are no easy answers. If nothing is done, the risks are real. If too much is done, different losses emerge. And caught between those options, Everyday residents are rarely given a real choice about what will change in their lives. Perhaps the most unsettling part is not whether a project succeeds or fails, but how accustomed we become to being adjusted, accustomed to shared space becoming conditional, accustomed to major changes unfolding without clear agreement. Once that familiarity takes hold, it does not shock. It simply becomes the new baseline for life. Nature does not resist. It reacts. People, in trying to control that reaction, sometimes forget they are changing as well from people who lived with the shoreline into people who must adapt to how the shoreline is managed. When this video ends, Florida's coast will still be there. But the question remains, not how long the shoreline will last, but how much else we are willing to change in the process of protecting it. And whether, at some point, we will realize that what is being protected most aggressively is not nature itself, but a way of thinking about control that we have grown used to living by. Thanks a lot for sticking with us till the very end. If you found this video useful, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss any of our daily uploads. And now, go ahead and explore some of our top recommended videos popping up on your screen. Goodbye, and see you in the next one.